All right, this is the fun stuff. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about WASH, and I'd like to know how many in here are familiar with WASH at all? Okay, a few of you. How many of you might consider yourself like a WASH practitioner? Ooh, all right, yeah, okay, one or two, great, fantastic. So much of this will be new, um, so this will be a good conversation. Oh, do I have a little? No? Uh, nothing, we got nothing, all right. Oh. All right, so this is going back to objective three from the action plan, looking at reduction of the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention and control. So we heard from Dr. Rahar earlier about, oh, oh go back, Ooh. Um, about um, IPC. And now I want to explain what WASH entails and how it relates to AMR, to summarize the global status of WASH, and to identify actions for preventing AMR through WASH. All right, I'll just do it this way. All right, so I want to start with a quote. Is anyone familiar with this? Plumbers are the original public health practitioners. Does anyone know who said this? Any guesses? No? Okay. Nope, sorry, it's a trick question. This is actually my father. Um, so my dad is a 30-year 30 uh, 30 veteran, 40-year veteran of plumbing. He owns a plumbing company. And when I became a public health practitioner, he said, really, plumbers were the original public health practitioners. And at the time, I kind of you know, probably nodded my head and said, yeah, yeah, dad, sure, sure, sure. But when I entered public health school in America, what is the first thing they tell you about? Jon Snow and the Broad Street Pump. So to quickly refresh your memory, for those of you who this might have been some time, Dr. Snow was uh, living in London during the 1854 cholera outbreak, and he had a suspicion that this wasn't just miasmas that was causing the cholera outbreak, that there was some kind of germ that was causing this. And he suspected that if he took the handle off the pump and on Broad Street, he would end the epidemic. And of course, this is how we start with modern epidemiology. So really, we were demonstrating here water and sanitation as foundational to public health. So if you look at these charts and looking at child mortality from the 1800s onward, uh, we start to see a decline in child mortality starting in about the mid 19th century. And we know that vaccinations and get anything here. No, okay. Um, vaccinations and sulfa drugs and antibiotics starting in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, or sorry, 1930s, 40s, 50s. But we start to see a decline in child mortality before that. And that is where we can see the impact of sanitation and hygiene in uh, driving public health at the time. So in WASH, we like to talk about the fecal oral cycle. If you ever want to spend a lot of time talking about shit, come join us in WASH. It is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have what we call the F diagram. The F diagram has uh, six components. Feces, fingers, flies, fluids, uh, fields, and food. Um, and so if you look at this diagram on the right, you can see um, we go from one source with the, fe uh, the feces, and then there are these different vectors in which you're transmitting to the new host. Um, and so, ooh, ooh, thank you, sir. All right, so we have uh, fingers up here top, um, and then uh, as we look at what could be preventing the spread, you have these different barriers, and that's where wash is coming in. The toilet barrier, the safe water barrier, the hygiene barrier. So as you can see, uh, the toilet barrier is going to prevent um, flies and we can prevent uh, contamination of fields, fluids, et cetera. Um, drinking water can be a safe water barrier access here. Hygiene is going to prevent uh, food hygiene as well as hand hygiene. So what is WASH? The acronym Water Sanitation Hygiene. We're looking at uh, water access, storage, distribution, treatment, source protection, wastewater. Then you have sanitation, that's specifically toilets and latrines, as well as fecal sludge management. That is what we do with the feces after it leaves the toilet. How do you manage it? And then hygiene, which is looking at hand hygiene, personal hygiene, menstrual hygiene management. I will talk also about um, wash and healthcare facility settings. And in that case, we're talking also about 
um, waste management, so healthcare waste management, as well as environmental cleaning. So that's context specific. I'll talk about that in a bit. So how does WASH link to AMR? WHO put out a technical brief on wash and wastewater as it relates to the reduction of, I of infection and um, AMR, and they came up with three primary ways in which wash is related to the transmission of AMR. The first is the dispersal of wash, sludge, and manure that could potentially result in transmission of infection. So this is the basic concept of the waterborne illness. Um, this might be uh, concerns about cholera, for example, the outbreak in Zimbabwe right now. Then there's the silent transmission of resilient microorganisms with low pathogenicity. So this is the idea that um, within a healthcare facility, if you HCIs that are passed on, if we don't have proper um, infection control in place. And then lastly, the release of fecal and other pollutants into the environment, which may pre promote conditions that are um, ideal for um, the emergence of new resistant genes. I put it, came up with this on the plane because I felt like there is no infographic that could really explain what I wanted to talk about here. But if you look at on the uh, left side here, you have your three um, interventions that we were talking about. So lack of um, access to clean water and um, soap, lack of access to safely managed sanitation, and then we have the effluent from uh, manufacturing and farms. So if you don't have clean water and soap, you can't perform hygiene or infection control practices. You also, if you have um, a lack of access to sanitation, um, you'll end up with a consumption of unsafe drinking water. And then that will lead to the spread of infectious diseases, as well as the spread of waterborne diseases, which touches on number, okay, touches on number one and two over here, increased consumption of antibiotics and the transmission of resilient pathogens. And then again, at the bottom here, looking at from the effluent, from manufacturing and farms, leading to highly concentrated microbials and wastewater, plus feces released into the environment, is leading to the promotion of resistance. So when we look back at the wash services um, that are provided, water sanitation and hygiene, I think it's really critical to understand any wash intervention you do is AMR sensitive. Let me say that again. Any wash activity you do is AMR sensitive. This means the wash community should be your best friends. Everything we're doing is supporting um, the reduction of uh, or thwarting the spread of AMR. So I love this uh, infographic. It comes from this uh, technical brief I mentioned. It's actually originally produced by FAO, so thank you all for that. Um, but it really, I think it's a little bit blurry, I apologize, but it helps demonstrate um, how you see the movement of um, antimicrobials in the environment as well as potential sources of infection, um, whether it's going from healthcare facilities, communities, manufacturing, as well as animal and plant production. In 2020, there was also a report that came out from the Lancet, um, excuse me, not Lancet, from Wellcome Trust. Um, and uh, many of you may be familiar with this. This was looking at a global response to AMR. And they included in this um, a matrix that looked at the feasibility and the impact of different interventions. What I'd like to point out is the top right corner. What would be most feasible and um, have the most impact? There are only two things in that quadrant, clean water and sanitation and human infection prevention and control. So we must invest in this. We must be investing in prevention if we want to see the greatest impact and have the greatest feasibility of addressing AMR. Also interesting, when they were putting this report together, a consultancy firm was doing all the interviews. Some of you may have been a part of this. And they asked me, Lindsay, wash is really hard. Should we really be putting this as part of the AMR response? To which I laughed in their face and said, absolutely, something that is hard should not be the reason why we don't do something. Um, this is where you bring in your colleagues and wash who are experts in this, who can partner with you. We're not asking for AMR people to become wash people, but certainly need to bring wash to the table. So what is the global status of WASH? If WASH is so critical to this process, where do things stand? Oopsie. Our colleagues yesterday mentioned the JMP. So the JMP is the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program for Water Supply, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Um, this is a fantastic resource. They collect data from every country. They do country consultations to talk to the countries about the data that's available and they publish reports every other year. You can go to washdata.org and download your country file. Everything is fully available. 
And as of, these numbers are slightly out of date, apologies, um, because their report just came out. Um, but as of uh, this year, the number is actually 27% of the or 25% of the population lack safely managed drinking water. That means that the water is uh, from an improved source, so it's protected from potential con contamination, it's available and readily used, and it is uh, free of contamination. So basically, one quarter of the population is not able to drink safe drinking water. 50% uh, of the population or so lack safely managed sanitation services. Uh, these are services that are available to the household and are protected from, um, protected from potential uh, exposure and a release of fecal waste into the, the environment to then potentially cause um, infection. And then 29% of the population, I think it's now 27, lack basic hygiene services. This means that there is not access to hand washing at the um, household level. So uh, actually during the COVID pandemic, um, the very beginning, Dr. Tedros made this a big announcement about safe hands, clean hands, we all need to wash our hands. You guys might remember this. And colleagues from low and middle in income countries hit on the note that there is a little bit of tone deafness in this when 30 percent, sorry, one third of the world can't actually wash their hands at home. So what are we asking of our colleagues to do to protect themselves, the world to protect themselves if they can't, um, if they don't have the basic services in place to do this. Healthcare facilities also have um, major issues. 22% uh, of the world's healthcare facilities lack basic water services. Uh, in this case, this actually doesn't even refer to whether or not the water is clean. This is whether there's an improved water source on premises that is available. Um, so whether or not that source is actually clean uh, would significantly reduce this number. 10% of the health, world's healthcare facilities lack toilets. Um, that's a really low bar. Uh, that doesn't even ask whether or not that toilet is functional. Uh, we don't have that data yet. So you can presume the situation is much worse. And then lastly, 50% of the world's healthcare facilities lack hygiene services. So this is both um, hand washing and alcohol-based hand rub at points of care, as well as at toilets. And for this one, the biggest issue is whether or not there is availability for hand washing at toilets, particularly for patients. As I mentioned, the JMP uh, has these amazing reports, and amazing data. This is one um, example of what they'll put together. They do things as ladders, so as you can see here, you talk about like an unimproved or um, surface water source versus something called limited, which might be somewhat better, but not fully. Basic is used to be the minimum standard, and now we're trying to go to safely managed, meaning the water is not just available from an improved source, but it's clean water. Um, same thing with sanitation and hygiene. Um, you can see we've made progress. So since 2015, you can see there is an upward trend in all of these, which is great news. Um, and if you were to look at the reports going back to 2000, we've made significant progress, but there's still billions of people um, from healthcare facilities. I think 3 billion people go to healthcare facilities where they can't uh, effectively wash their hands. So we should be particularly concerned about the infections that will come about from this. Um, and to this point, just a reminder, Unsafe Wash is still responsible for the death of around 400,000 children under the age of five every year, which is about 1,000 children a day. And children in conflict settings are 20 times more likely to die of diarrheal disease than they are of the actual conflict. If you're aware of what's happening in Gaza right now, there's huge, huge concern about the lack of drinking water that's available um, as much as they are concerned about the violence that's taking place. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, in addition to water, sanitation, and hygiene, these are the JMP data. Um, there's also healthcare waste. Um, the JMP doesn't conduct surveys, so they're going off of the surveys that are happening in your own countries and collecting that and compiling that. So there isn't much data yet on um, healthcare waste as well as environmental cleaning. So to come up with a way to globally monitor environmental cleaning, uh, we came up with proxy indicators uh, because it's too difficult to have a subjective measure of cleanliness in an environment. So there are two um, specific indicators for this, uh, whether or not protocols on environmental cleaning are available, and then that those with cleaning responsibilities have been trained. Um, I have a bit of a beef with the second description. Um, I don't like that we're not requiring that there be cleaners. I think individuals whose job is specifically cleaning is really critical for um, us to move forward on IPC. Um, and again, I'm going to make a plug, please, please, please include cleaners in anything you do. 
Um, but this is to recognize the fact that some facilities do not have the, the resources to actually hire a separate cleaner to do these jobs, that nurses and midwives are still responsible for cleaning. Um, in Cambodia, I remember midwives telling me they were responsible for cleaning the delivery room after the baby was born. Um, so that's certainly the reality in many places still. There are 21 countries that have reported on this. You can see all 21 countries here. And the biggest thing to note is that there is a huge uh, uh, variance in the um, results we found. So when you look at Vanuatu, who has um, very uh, low levels of basic service, only 5%, Micronesia is up to 36%. Um, again, talking about whether or not they have protocols available at the healthcare facility and whether staff with responsibilities to clean have been trained. A point here that when we talk about wash, wash access, this might seem obvious, but I do want to drill in that it is not equitable. Um, and this is a great way to look at um, development in particular. The least developed countries are the ones that have the greatest issues with access to wash. Um, but even within countries, there's a big concern about equi um, equity, and this often falls along the rural-urban divide, though it should be noted with urbanization, we're having major concerns about sanitation. How do we manage the sanitation from cities to ensure that it's not being spread? And then, in particular, and we were having conversations about gender the other day, at, at least at our table, um, women and girls are disproportionately affected by poor access to wash. In communities, they're more likely to be the ones to carry water if the water source isn't within their home. They are more likely to miss school because if they are having um, their periods and there's no toilets at school, they're less likely to attend. Um, and then also, when you think about a healthcare facility setting, who is coming into the facility for uh, major surgeries and whatnot? Women coming to deliver. Um, there's also things like uh, postpartum uh, hygiene, which has to be managed. And then lastly, thinking about healthcare workers. 75% of the world's healthcare workers are female, meaning they are at greater risk of infection when they work in facilities that do not have good wash and IPC in place. And similarly, uh, they're often not in a position of power to advocate. Predominantly, uh, males, men are still in positions of leadership. So really critical we think about the role of women and girls in this and ensuring that they're involved, not just in us delivering these services, but solving these problems and being at the forefront of these conversations. And certainly that's true for the AMR conversation as well. So where are we in meeting these gaps? I've told you that there is gaps in reaching basic wash services, and I'm also here to tell you there's gaps in getting funding to reach those gaps to address these issues. So three times the investment is needed, about um, $110 billion per year is needed. And then in healthcare facilities, $7 billion is needed um, over the next seven years till 2030 to re reach basic services in all the least developed countries. When it comes to WASH, one thing to note is it's not just about the initial uh, making, available, making available the water service, the sanitation service, the hygiene service. Sustainability is critical. And this comes down to operations and maintenance and making sure there's funding for the recurrent needs of um, spare parts, making sure there's people available to monitor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you've ever been to pretty much anywhere in the continent of Africa, you'll come ac across boreholes that have um, been broken and haven't been repaired. Um, so this is a major concern within the WASH community and something that we struggle with when it comes to talking to donors is they want to know that their investment will be sustainable. Um, so we have to have systems in place for this. So if you engage your WASH colleagues, make sure you grill them on what their sustainability plans are for O&M. Um, on the left or the right here is um, something we put together um, calling governors, uh, governments and partners as related to um, there was a UN water conference. The first one in 40 years was held in New York in March. And these were our calls to our partners about how to address um, scale of investment, resilience, et cetera, with a focus on prioritizing leaving no one behind. Quick pause, question, quiz. Um, climate change is definitely going to impact wash access. What do you think my two concerns are? And these photos should help share this. Any guesses of what we can, how we're concerned about wash will imp uh, climate change will impact wash? Yes. Limited access to water. Yep, absolutely. You had one here. Flooding. Flooding. Yeah. So essentially, you're either going to have too much water or not enough water, right? Um, and that's a really dumbed-down version of this, but that's essentially the the situation. 
either scenario can reverse the progress we've made. So you saw on those graphs, we were actually, we've made progress since 2015, a lot since 2000. Um, I am, and I am the, I speak for the entirety of the WASH community here, deeply concerned about as climate change continues to impact the world, how we will lose uh, on the progress we've made and increase the spread of infection. So this is the triple th threat we're looking at here. Um, and this could come from poor water quality. If you don't have enough water, you're drinking uh, surface water, for example. It's what they're concerned about in Gaza right now. Um, no hand washing. If you have flooding, you're going to potentially flood the sanitation systems and spread fecal waste into the environment. And then um, we can see, for example, a spread of infection directly after major floods. This also, if I have a few high income country people in here, or even middle income country, this is where I think this becomes very notable. Even if you do have access to water and sanitation in your country, you may not even use the word wash in high income country, country contexts. Climate change is definitely going to put pressure on those systems. I come from California. We are deeply concerned about uh, the lack of water in our country, in our state. Um, maybe you guys remember in South Africa, there was that zero water day that they were counting down to in like, I think it was 2018, maybe 2019. Uh, yeah, 2019, right before 18. Okay, right before the world ended with COVID. Um, but uh, there was a, there was huge concerns here about what we would how we would address this. Um, there are some solutions. Desalination is one. A lot of these solutions are very expensive. Um, so we have a lot to do to build resiliency into these systems, both in high income contexts and low and middle income contexts. A case study on this, uh, you may be familiar with the Pakistan flooding. Colleagues from Pakistan can speak to this. Uh, there was three times the flooding, or three times the rainfall in Pakistan in 2022 than it was, um, than, than had been usual, impacting 33 million people. This was a huge catastrophe. Um, there, once the floodwaters reside, um, subsided, there was uh, more than 5 million people impacted by this because their water systems had been damaged and they were forced to rely upon um, contaminated water. The most recent data, which when I was looking this up, um, there aren't a ton of sit reps, even though the situation is still quite poor. I think they stopped reporting some months ago on this, but at the time, over 600,000 of cases of acute watery diarrhea or skin infections had been reported. So when you think about the need for antibiotics, um, and there's going to be growing need based on these uh, climate disasters. We have to think about how that fits into this broader picture when we address um, AMR. Spotlight on healthcare settings. So I have a lot of medical professionals in the room. This will be particularly of interest to you all. Um, this is a bit on the nose, but in January 2020, uh, WHO launched a, a list of priority urgent health challenges for the coming decade. I will say it did say preparing for pandemics on this list. They at least were uh, ahead of the game in a sense. But keeping healthcare clean was on this list. And really thinking about dialing down to the basics. And that's where water sanitation hygiene couples with infection prevention and control. So as, uh, as we look at it, and the way I would approach it, is WASH is foundational to be able to deliver on IPC. And so if you look at this document, this is the minimum requirements for IPC programs coming from WHO. If you're not familiar with the resource, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, but it has this diagram here, and you can see at the very bottom, we have built environment, materials, and equipment, which emphasizes the fact that you need a clean, hygienic environment to be able to facilitate um, prevention and control of uh, healthcare, healthcare acquired infections, as well as AMR, including having wash services and infrastructure available and appropriate IPC materials and equipment. So I would also argument, argue that in your education and training, you would need to have wash elements included in that, including your cleaners. Um, but really thinking about how these things are two sides of the same coin, very closely linked. You cannot deliver on IPC without having wash services available. And how do they interlink? In all of the things I've done in my career, this is the one thing that gets reposted everywhere I go, my very basic diagram. So if you think about WASH and IPC, they, are, they certainly have things that are unrelated, but there is this green area of overlap. And I've defined this in four areas. Hand hygiene, environmental cleanliness and laundry, medical equipment processing, and healthcare waste management. Um, as we were, a colleague earlier saying, Jorge was saying, behavior change is really hard and it's something we all have to focus on. Um, so 
this is not to say that you just put in the infrastructure and behavior change magically magically starts to happen. Certainly, we need to build this into the program to ensure that um, the hand hygiene compliance programs are underway. But you can't even begin to address hand hygiene if you do not have the basics in place. Um, and I'd certainly say in some cases, we go to healthcare facilities where there's water on today, but it's not going to be available in three waters, three hours. So it's not just about having it sometimes, but it readily available to ensure any behavior change you're trying to support can be practiced regularly. If a doctor goes to wash their hands and the tap is off that moment, you're going to start to um, uh, reverse the progress you've made on this behavior change um, and not lead to that intervention occurring regularly. So if you think about this as the setting we're concerned about, uh, wash should be related in a variety of areas here. You think about whether or not they have clean hands, clean equipment, as we talked about this morning, whether or not the cleaner is trained, has appropriate PPE, and has um, uh, knowledge of, the, of the, what she needs to be doing in the room, the clean surfaces, and that the waste is being managed appropriately. So lastly, I want to talk about actions to prevent AMR through WASH. And this comes from the technical brief that I mentioned earlier from WHO on WASH and wastewater um, to prevent AMR. And there are six areas of action. The first area is coordination and leadership to ensure that WASH and waste management colleagues are included, or waste management is included in um, national policies and plans that colleagues are around the table to help uh, define what would be uh, adequate targets and interventions here. The second area is households and communities. This is essentially trying to meet SDG 6, which is ensuring universal access of wash uh, for all. And uh, that's including as well wastewater treatment and sludge treatment, which is particularly critical for the AMR space. I think our wash colleagues tend to focus particularly on, on access, and sometimes the waste side of things gets overlooked, and that is particularly for this area very critical. The third area is healthcare facilities. So as I mentioned, it's ensuring that WASH is available to be able to provide IPC. The fourth area is animal and plant production. So improving hygiene and wastewater um, uh, and sludge management in food production. So linking back to all the work that FAO is doing on this. And then area five, manufacturing of um, antimicrobials, ensuring that we reduce the, re the release of antimicrobials and ARGs into waterways. And then lastly, looking at surveillance and research. Um, and this is an area from the, um, the recent publication of the 40 research questions around AMR, um, where two are related to WASH, and investigate the impact of the contribution and the contribution of community WASH and waste management interventions on the burden and drivers of AMR, as well as investigate implementation strategies and the impact of WASH-related interventions in healthcare settings on the burden of HCIIs and anti, um, antimicrobial medicine prescribing. And I think this last one is particularly interested, uh, interesting because when you look at low resource settings, um, we can't do it all, right? We're not going to be able to invest across the board. So how do we identify the most cost effective strategies that are going to be beneficial to reduce um, infections and reduce AMR in the facilities? And this links back to what we were talking about earlier this morning. I think there is great complementary between WASH and IPC and building AMS programming. I don't think you need to see these things as completely separate. Certainly, you need different partners in the room to help build this, but you can have a multifactorial program that is bringing together all the pieces and maybe even doing this in a phased approach um, to ensure that you're not just trying to um, reduce prescribing and think about that when you're also still having an onslaught of infections because you're not doing anything to reduce the infections. So I think there's, uh, I think this particularly is good for thinking about staff morale and, and thinking about how healthcare facilities and healthcare providers are able to do their jobs. It must be incredibly demoralizing to be in the healthcare facility that I presented this morning where you lose three out of uh, five quintuplets, and then you feel like you have no ability to address this, and then you're coming in just doing um, microbial surveillance. And so, not to say just, not to offend anyone here, but I do think there's something to be said about coupling that with something that's very action-oriented for the physician and feeling like they have the ability to reduce the, the burden in the first place, and then really address the major concerns when it comes to um, prescribing, and prescribing when appropriate. So how do you work with WASH? Has anyone worked with WASH? Anyone talk to WASH colleagues? 
Oh, good. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. You people. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to send you all home with a homework assignment. Um, and that is find out who your WASH colleagues are. The great news is WASH is a teeny tiny community. So I guarantee you if you go back and you ask one person who works in WASH in your country, they can connect you to anyone you would need, um, whether you want to talk healthcare facilities, agriculture, et cetera. Um, we're very small and tight knit and we love being included in things, particularly health things. Um, so talk to your Ministry of Health, Environmental Health colleagues. Talk to UNICEF. If you work with UNICEF on health, ask them to connect you to WASH. Work with WHO and INGOs. World Vision is the lar largest provider of WASH services outside of UNICEF. They have a huge um, footprint all over the world. Once you've talked to them, if you are in the position of doing policy making, I strongly encourage you to talk to them about um, joining in uh, the planning of national action plans to make sure they can link in what they're doing. Every WASH intervention is AMR sensitive. Why would you not include this in your plans? They're already doing the work. You can think about how you include that, but then also how you can be more strategic. You can think about guiding where geographically we need to focus some of these interventions. Um, we know within a, a given country, um, A, uh, there's equity issues in the first place, but you may have differences in um, climate risks, for example. Um, if there's severe risk of flooding in certain parts of the country at certain times of year, being aware of that building in resilience and thinking how that will impact the spread of AMR could go a long way if we're, we work effectively across our um, sectors. Several countries have done this. I don't know if we have Tanzania or Ethiopia colleagues in the room, but I applaud your countries. WASH is explicitly mentioned. It's the only two countries I've seen that in so far. So please bring them into these discussions. When possible, share data and request of their, them to do the same with you. Um, so as much as I'm saying go, go out and bring them in, you can also ask them to help you out sharing where they're working, sharing the coverage data um, in healthcare facilities, sharing what they know about the facility's access to WASH and IPC. Align messaging and advocacy. I think this is critical when we talk about the new upcoming HLM, but certainly even on a country level, making sure we're on the same page and collaborate on research. And so lastly, I just want to leave you with some key resources that might be useful um, for all of you who are new to WASH, if you're interested in looking into this more. Um, as I mentioned, the JMP does do um, every other year publications. Um, and when you talk to WASH, there's two ways to look at it. We're technical in the sense that we might have colleagues focused on water access, fecal sludge management, but we also break things down by um, specific area in society. So we focus on households, schools, and healthcare facilities. Like I'm a Washington healthcare facilities expert. Um, you may find others who are deep in the work in communities. So if you're specifically interested in an area because you're a doctor and you work in that, there is specific reports and resources just on that topic. Um, and washinghcf.org is a great place for the healthcare facility setting. Washdata.org is for JMP. And then we have all sorts of tools. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much.